Hey, you're listening to the Road to a Billion podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Georgi, and I'm glad to have you with me here today. The Road to a Billion is a call-in radio show style podcast where you can ask me questions about freelancing, copywriting, entrepreneurship, mindset, scaling funnels, relationships, money, and more. The reason for the name is because uh, the copy that I have written for myself and my clients will be hitting a billion dollars by basically the end of this year. I don't have the official tally, but if it's not by the end of this month, I mean, like, like very quickly thereafter. Uh, and the goal is to make an impact in the lives of a billion people over the next 10 years, whether that is uh, mental, emotional, financial, spiritual, physical, uh, relational, whatever it may be. We'll start taking calls in like eh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, probably. And um, you know, the way that works is you just put your questions into the uh, Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, if you're joining us here on Zoom and watching it live or you know interacting live. And uh, then my friend Ed Ray will go through, review those questions and He'll feed them to me, but also he'll answer some of them as well. And, uh, you know, we'll do our best to help. Ed, you want to go ahead and say hi to everybody? Hey, everybody. My name is Ed Ray, and I am uh, I recently got a haircut, and I uh, recently trimmed my beard down. So that's, uh, that's a new thing. Um, and I basically, well, I do a lot of things. But one of the things I think that's most cat that can really help showcase a bit more of what I do is... I, me and my partners, we help people get their uh, Facebook accounts back from Facebook. So if you get banned, shut down, uh, ads get rejected, like, and you think, you know, oh shoot, like there's no getting back. There's no, there's no coming back from this. We got cucked by Zuck. We, you know, you can't get your business manager back. You lost, you know, 600 grand worth of pixel data, just completely shut down overnight and you're scrambling and you can't get it back. We help get your stuff back and protect you on uh, the back side and the front side. So you separate your, uh, your personal identity or your client's identity from your Facebook assets. So you won't have that issue again. And uh, we basically help you get back on Facebook and stay on Facebook. So there we go. That's, yeah, the last part was the, the succinct part. Because like, not getting cut by Zuck, you know, worked. And now it's like, we help you get back on Facebook and stay on Facebook. That's like the, the tagline there. Um, yeah, dude, it's, it's, it's better to sell the cure rather than the prevention. So now we offer white glove done for you services. Oh man, oh man. And what's up, Marco? I see you on Facebook Live as well. For those on Facebook Live uh, who are watching. Ooh. What's up, Cecilia? Yeah, what's up everybody? So um, like I said, we'll start taking questions in a few minutes here. Uh, sometimes I do like a like an opening monologue. I'm not gonna, like a, I don't know, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna ramble for like five minutes basically about interesting stuff. And um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about it because it's my show and that's what I feel like doing. And um, then we'll answer questions and provide a lot of value. So uh, things that I'm thinking about right now. One, I have two things on my mind. You know, one is I went out with um, one of my best friends and my wife yesterday around like 3.30 and we went to like the casino by my house. And my friend had just had a big like uh, lawsuit with like an ex-business partner dismissed. The next business partner like had no like uh, grounds for it and all that. Um, but my friend wanted to celebrate. So we had some tequila, played a little, uh, little craps. Uh, then I had some like seafood, some oysters, had a little more tequila, played a little blackjack. And I went home and like, it was funny because I woke up this morning at like 5.30 and I wanted to like feel guilty, but I'm like, I literally have nothing to feel guilty about. It was like, I like, like didn't over drink. I didn't like over gamble. I just had fun and then woke up. But I do find it funny how there's those times where like, I have that habit of like that shame habit from back in the day to where like, I wake up and like want to feel like, you know, mad at myself and shameful. And I have to remember like, there's literally no reason, but I just makes me think about other people who sometimes have that same pattern of like, you know, you like, you go out and have a good time, but then you like, you want to beat yourself up. But then if you look at it objectively, there's like no reason why you should beat yourself up. So that's one thought I have, because I think it's something that I've, I've talked about other people too, where like, you want to like, as entrepreneurs, we feel like we, we feel like we need to be productive all the time. So then like, if we go out and do something that we want to do or like have fun or like cut loose, like there's that part where we just sort of like immediately feel guilty and we want to, you know, make ourselves feel like crap about it. But really that that's like the toxic part, like the going out occasionally, like obviously if I went out and did, what I did yesterday, like every day or even like every week, like, I think that would be like, I don't know, every week maybe, but like, I don't, I don't, but the point is like that, you know, if it was like a, a consistent thing, like then it was like a habit. Sure. But like, I think it, it rarely is. If you just go out and have fun, you should never beat yourself up. And then the other part of it too, is I think we, we get afraid of like, that it's going to become a habit, but like, is there actually evidence that that kind of behavior is going to become a habit or not? Right. Like, it's like, if you just like cut loose once every month or two or three, and then you don't like cut loose again after that, like, is that really a habit? And like, you know, so kind of interesting thoughts here. Um, I'm looking at the chat because I know some people are mentioning like 
how they can really relate to that. Um, you know, yeah, Gurley said, I played one game of league of league last night after a good day of work and still felt guilty. Um, yeah, well, I said it happens for employeepreneurs too. I mean, well, you're like a CEO at this point. So you're basically, I mean, you're like, you're like a boss, you know, um, Matias said, always feels like we're not doing enough. We have a basic negative feeling about ourselves. Um, yeah, exactly, Matias. Um, yeah, Nicholas uh, Corvista said, yeah, my longtime friend has come back home for a bit and I feel it for sure. Super relatable. So, Shannon, yeah, it's interesting. But uh, yeah, I agree, right? I mean, I have the same anxiety about like over the next uh, like week. I'm taking most of next week off. And then I'm honestly finding that this week I'm kind of, I was very sort of feeling like I want to take a lot more time off this week anyway. So, I'm kind of working like half days, but I'm having so much guilt about that. Like I had to pull myself away yesterday, even when my friend was coming over because I thought about it and there's like, no, I didn't have anything else I had to do. I'm like, I'm just trying to find ways to fill the void. Right. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I can find work for myself to do. I can find things for myself to do, but like none of these things have to get done. And if my mind and if I'm telling if my mind is saying, Hey, you know, take a break, like I'm just gonna take a break. I go back to this all the time, the paradoxical nature of downtime. And, um, and it's actually a really good burnout mitigation strategy. Cause I'm like, if I just sort of start taking it easier for this week and, and next week, and honestly, even the week after Christmas, we're going to do my copy starter feedback um, for copy starter is taking two weeks off, but like until then, then, and you know, I'm going to do like uh, other things I have to get, like other things I have to get done. I'm like, then I'm going to read books. I bought a whole bunch of books. I'll show you guys. Cause it's my show. I'm, I go, fuck, I'm getting from my computer. I'll show you guys a bunch of my books that I bought. I'll show you guys my hall right here. You can hear my voice, like the voice of God, like a master projecting too. Let's do it. Back, back. You guys want to see my Amazon haul? I would take you with me, but it was on my computer. So I bought one called, basically all that I'm looking at for the next couple of weeks is I'm gonna look at like trends and like things that I think are gonna be like, not just for 2021, but like the years to come, right? So I got a book called, The Future is Faster Than You Think, How Converging Technologies Are Transforming Business Industries in Our Lives. It's by uh, Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler, who are both kind of futurists. Um, so this one looks super interesting. I got another one on that motif or theme called non-obvious, how to see what others miss and predict the future. Sorry, non-obvious mega trends, which looks super interesting to me too. Cause I love the idea of like big trends that we all miss. The reason this all came about by the way, is cause I was looking at Roblox. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Roblox or not, R-O-B-L-O-X. Um, it's like a gaming platform. So what's funny is I think half the people here are like obviously and half the people have never heard of it before. Um, but it's like a gaming platform. They have 150 million active users. They did about 500 million plus in revenue. I think like last year or last quarter, I forget which one it was. Um, they, their last investment round was from Anderson Horowitz that valued them at $4 billion. And they were going to do an IPO in 2020, but they moved it to 2021. So I kept seeing like articles about it. In fact, they just like per, uh, poached this guy from Google, who's like a kid genius, like employee. And like, um, it's like something crazy, like half of all kids have played, uh, like Roblox recently. And so I actually created like an account, went on and started playing one of the games on there called Adopt Me. And I wanted to see like just what it was like. And it was so easy. Like I set up my account and like I was playing to like to research. And like it was like 30 minutes later and I'm just like going through Adopt Me, like going through this magical world. And there's like kids on like dinosaurs and like there's like the chat is like a bunch of weird acronyms and gibberish. I had no idea, but I'm like, holy shit, like this entire world exists. Um, and you know, frankly is probably going to get bigger and bigger. And I think about that, plus then I think about like virtual reality and I think about the convergence of those things. Um, I just think that there's a lot going on there. So I was like, man, like I should really look at what other big things are going to happen with virtual reality with like trends, how are they going to converge and how does that affect me, marketing, entrepreneurship and life in general. And then because of all that, I was like, uh, I started messing with Roblox and I'm totally going to buy it the IP when it comes up. But also I was like, let me start reading about stuff. So non-obvious mega trends. Then I saw that, like, I love just the Amazon recommended stuff. So I got the big nine, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Tencent, all these different things, how the tech tens and their thinking machines could warp humanity. Cause I find that to be really interesting. I got another book called Digital Transformation, Survive and Thrive in an Era of Mass Extinction, which frankly sounds kind of scary, but at the same time, yeah, it's got like a endorsements from Eric Schmidt from Google and Charles Schwab and Gary Kasparov and a lot of interesting people. Uh, this is a book infomercial Luffy said, yep, exactly what it is. 2030, how today's biggest trends will couple and, or collide and reshape the future of everything. This one's not a trend one, but Hooked, I don't know if you people have heard of this one, but basically this guy, he wrote a second book called Indistractable. I actually read Indistractable first, or second, sorry, Indistractable first. Um, 
But basically this guy's want to figure out how to make tech super addictive um, and addicting. And then like, and it was this book that was the blueprint. So it's curious, I'm like, yeah, I wanted to read it. So I ordered that one. Um, then he felt really bad and wrote a book about how to not be addicted to like tech. So it's kind of funny, but um, I got a book called A Road Without Work because as a person who teaches about freelancing and coaching and um, help people how to like kind of create their own sort of uh, financial path, you know, and escape the cave. I'm like, I'd be curious, the, the future of work's gonna change dramatically, right? Like, I mean, like we're, there's universal basic, basic income is probably gonna happen in the next like 20 or 30 years. Uh, people won't have to work um, like, but I, I guess scary actually in a way because it, it leads to like a weird dystopian future. Uh, but I'm like, yeah, I wanna read about the trends. And then this book was just my recommended things uh, called Money for Nothing, The Scientists, Fraudsters and Corrupt Politicians Who Reinvented Money, Panned a Nation and Made the World Rich. It's basically the uh, history of the financial system, the modern financial system. So I'm pumped. So for the next couple of weeks, I'm just gonna read a bunch of those books and get ideas and let my diffuse you know, brain go to work. And I think it'll actually lead to all kinds of really good marketing ideas and all that kind of stuff. Brayden asked if I'm speed reading, uh, maybe some of them. Uh, I'm not sure yet. You know, I think it'll depend on the book and, like, and the density of it. Like this one about money for nothing, like I probably won't. It's more like a history kind of biography and I, I don't like to speed read those as much. Um, but some of the books about like future trends and stuff, I probably will speed read more. Yes. So that's a long rant. That kind of was like an interesting uh, thing on going from like, you know, tequila last night to like my, my reading plans for the next few weeks, but you know, figured it was interesting. Wanted to share that. Um, the book rest is great by Alex, uh, suiting Kim paying for resting. Sujin, cool. And James Weiss, do you take notes on books or just reread and retain? Um, yeah, I do take notes actually. So not always, but uh, I'll, I'll like kind of highlight and underline and then I also go back and type up the notes sometimes. Um, and then I will also like write down ideas. So I basically have two notebooks at all times with me. So one is like my daily scratch paper notebook. Um, and then the other one is sort of like my big idea notebook. And I kind of keep them separate so that if I have big ideas, I can just write those down in a separate notebook and they don't get like muddled with like that. And then me like scratch writing about like uh, notes about something on them. Um, but yeah, I love to read. So when one your book interesting you should check out how to take smart notes you have to look at that james for sure um Ed Ray, are you reading anything right now are you are you much of a reader uh i used to be very much of a reader i took a break for quite a few months um right now uh i haven't been reading as much um i just started reading uh what's it called E the email client horde book from Ben Settle, just because like that's something I'm working on now. Uh, but I'm also reading, I think it's called The Screenwriter's Guide to Tribulations. Ooh, that sounds cool. Um, by, I mean, the author says Dr. Henry Jones, but uh, I think Ron Lynch wrote it. Um, yeah, cool. I've, I've been reading that. That's been very fascinating. Uh, it talks all about how basically the like the the Bibles, like you know the Torah, like the Jewish Bible, the Christian Bible, and then the oh, I don't know what the Islamic Bible is. Holy crap, it's blanking me right the now. Quran. Quran, the Quran. Thank you, the Quran. So the Quran, the Torah, and the Christian Bible. Uh, they basically predicted what's happening right now, like the coronavirus, Trump, like COVID, everything. Yeah. Uh, yep. so. Ron shared some of that, his thoughts on that with me when I was with him uh, in person. It was pretty, uh, pretty wild. Dude, least. Ron's insane. Like, he's such a cool guy. <laughs> he is. He's an awesome guy. Um, cool, dude. Yeah. One other note, by the way, too, I want to, on the diffuse thinking and reading and all that. I mean, I, I just like, um, even the mornings, like I want to, I made back and I finished like a big letter last week. And so I've got some more stuff to write, but I kind of haven't been writing this morning or these, this week as much in the mornings. Um, yeah, Homo Deus is dope, but I think feed even like I go of 21 lessons for the 21st century by the same author, uh, Yuval Harar, Noah Harari. Um, but they're both dope. Um, but yeah, so I was like, I'm like looking at trends and then, and then you get cool ideas. Like one cool idea I just want to share. Um, I was going to write my daily email on this and then I'll say it and have time basically but um 
like my PR people were asking about, you know, they're looking for things in the news all the time, right? Like, like trending topics and I can come in as an expert and talk about them. So they're talking about like marketing for like the COVID-19 vaccine and kind of like thoughts on it. So then I was like looking at a bunch of the stuff of like the marketing efforts that are going on right now. And it was kind of funny, a couple of things that are funny. One is like the catchphrases and like slogans that they're choosing, like Pfizer and Moderna. And they're like catchphrases are like, it's like a science will win, like, you know, um, like science is great. And you're like, okay, but like what kind of like catchphrase is that for like an average person who just has like a, uh, like, you know, like they don't care about science. They care about going back to normal. They care about, you know, their business reopening. They care about being able to see their grandparents or their parents about worrying about getting them sick. So I'm like, damn, like they really are off the mark there. Um, but the more interesting thing to me was like looking at some data that showed like an ABC poll. It was like 80% of Americans say that they're like, they'll do the vaccine but only it was like 50% um, say they'll do it like in a hurry or like soon. So I was like, man, you know, the, the thing there is like, if you have 80% of the population gets vaccinated, right, then that creates enough immunity that the virus goes away. And you've got enough people who are like, yeah, I'm in. So the problem is not like, um, like acceptance of the vaccine. There's anti-vaxxers out there, sure. But like the problem is not with them. It's more about getting people to do it in a hurry because like the fast people do it. Then I'm, I'm thinking about this purely. I'm not. This is like if you're anti-vax, whatever. But like this is purely from perspective of like solving a problem, right? Um, and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. But then I'm like, damn, you know what? Really, like this entire thing is just like it's like a direct response problem, and then it's like a conversion problem because all it is is like you're getting you want people to respond to your like vaccine advertisements and respond by going to get vaccinated, and basically you're trying to convert them from not vaccinated to vaccinated. And like you can do it through marketing and i thought that was a really interesting kind of takeaway because i'm like you know basically like taking direct response elements and principles that we talk about or that i know i'm like you could just apply that to exactly what they're doing so like emotional storytelling answering what's in it for me right leading with emotion first and logic second like there's all these different things you've been doing in your marketing um and if you're like a big pharma company or vaccine company that uh then could you know could increase the likelihood of a conversion on the first try because the thing about direct response is like when somebody goes to like your sales page we want them to try and convert the first time and then we retarget them after um i was like yeah it's just an interesting way of, of looking at things the idea that like basically even something like getting people vaccinated is like a conversion problem and a direct response problem i don't know does that make sense is that interesting jamal thinks it's interesting thanks jamal on facebook live i think it's interesting thanks man i got you buddy i got you buddy like here's one more strategy for it real quick and then we're gonna take questions um another book on my desk right now is a classic you know influence go with robert uh, caldini and um you know, he talks about uh, the uh, like, uh, was it commitment and consistency, right? And how people, once you commit to something, you want to look like consistent, so you'll follow through. And there's like, the example for those of you who have read Influence about how they did the study in California in a California neighborhood in the 1960s, where they basically had a volunteer go to like door to door and ask people to put this giant billboard uh, in their front yard that said "Drive carefully," and they showed uh, like. They showed them a picture of what it looked like. And it was a picture of this really nice house of this giant, ugly billboard with like awful lettering blocking their entire view. And so when they went around the California neighborhood and asked people if they would do that, like 86% roughly were like, no, it was 83%, I think were like, no, like I wouldn't do that, right? Which makes sense. But um, then like there was a subset of that data where 76% of people said, yes, I'll do it, which is like very hard to understand why 76% of people will be like, you can ruin the value of my home and put this ugly billboard that's gonna like block my view. Like why, why did it happen? Well, it happened because two weeks prior to that, they'd had another volunteer go around and ask people to display like a three inch little card or placard that said like, you know, drive safe at their house. And people said, everyone said yeah to that because it was like three inches and they're like, all right, sure. But what they found is by just those people making that little small commitment about for that three inch card, those same people then were like dramatically like more likely to say yes to this giant billboard being placed in their yard too. And when you think about that principle, you're like, okay, well, how could that apply to like the COVID vaccine? You're like, well, you could do something where you're like a campaign where you're like, hey, like, you know, basically ask people to think about somebody in their life who they think could benefit from the vaccine. So like an elderly parent or grandparent or a friend with an autoimmune issue or whatever it is and be like, you know, like a campaign that gets people to commit to like telling one person, encouraging one person you love to get the vaccine. Because if people commit to telling one person to get vaccinated, then they're gonna be way more likely to get vaccinated as well. Because they made the commitment, they've told somebody else to do it. So now they want to look consistent and when the opportunity comes for them to get vaccinated, they're much more likely to actually get the vaccine too. So just another interesting idea or thought about how, you know, um, these marketing principles can be applied to like really big societal things. And again, this is regardless of if you're like pro-vax or anti-vax or whatever, and that's just one small example. So I don't know, a little interesting food for thought for everybody. 
Um, any other thing you want to add to that? It's cool. I'm, I'm seeing some uh, some fascinating, wild stuff. Love it. Wild. Cool. Cool. Love that you guys love it. Good stuff to share today. I got nothing to add, dude. That was killer. Cool. Thanks, man. That's because the, the, I'm giving myself the opportunity to just like read books and think and like research and like the good ideas come up, right? It's kind of cool. And then that all gets applied to business. But that's why you have to let yourself have some like downtime and like that few thinking time and like uh, sort of not like just be like, I have to be doing X, Y, Z. And if I'm not doing those things, I'm a total piece of shit. It's like, you gotta give yourself time to just sort of chill and, you know, think about life. So cool. Let's answer, let's answer some questions. I don't know. Why not? Who we got? What's going on? Let's have a look here. Would you, oh, there we go. Okay, cool. So I needed co-host first. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. That seems fair. You, we did so good last time. <laughs> I know. Thank God. Cause my internet, you know, I figured out what was wrong with my internet, but I'm kind of embarrassed to share. I don't know if I should share or not. You totally should. So we have like a Wi-Fi extender, um, in like Laura's office on the other side of the house. And, um, I literally connected to it one time around Halloween when I was shooting like a video outside and like using my computer, like as like a teleprompter. And now my computer keeps wanting to connect to that one. So like, I just basically was on the wrong Wi-Fi network and I didn't double check it. And that's why I was so crappy. Cause like, I'm it's, if you're in that area, then it's great. But in my office, like, but it's so stupid. I don't know why my computer defaults to that one. Now I literally, I've, I've been on my normal home Wi-Fi router for like, you know, three years now. And I connected the other one one time and now my computer is like just in love with the, the one that has like the weak signal and like tries to auto connect to that. It's like the most annoying. I have to go like forget network or something like that. I know, I know, I know Ari Sharp. I know you're right. The heart wants what the heart wants, bro. <laughs> the he, router. He, he <laughs> wants to go the distance, man. She's worth it. Yeah. Oh man. Yo. Okay. You think that's bad, bro? Freaking um, back when I used to live in my parents' place, I would be on like zoom calls with clients. And whenever my parents turned on the microwave, my Wi-Fi would shit the bed. Really? That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. But the worst thing is my dad co cooks everything in the microwave and so does my sister and my mom. Oh God. So like, I'll be on like a client call and then like, like trying to close somebody to, to pay me, you know, three, five K, whatever it is to do some shit for them. And they like... The Wi-Fi would just shit the bed for a solid like 20 minutes because like they would push it in the microwave for like 30 seconds and then take it out and then eat it or whatever and then like put something else in like for like five minutes like noodle soup or some shit like like the Mr. Noodle stuff and then like my dad would reheat his coffee afterward and then he would <laughs> take potatoes and then poke holes in them and then put them in the microwave and then bake them that way for like five minutes again and then eat that no as <laughs> that's how my dad cooks food uh, so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> cooks food and then my sister would and my mom would make their oatmeal in the fucking thing and i was like i'm not getting paid today okay i'm fine with that that's fine whatever whatever that's fine dude that's hilarious so, hilarious. so there's a little it's a little thing yeah, so and much. no santiago that does not mean i'm the black sheep of the family who knows how to cook um i'm not like good at cooking yeah no i'm good at eating though that's good that's important yeah no. you know if you can only be good at one it's probably better to be good at eating i suppose exactly also malai that means i do not use microwaves i fucking hate microwaves i refuse to use them for a variety of reasons anyway yeah. so anyways so yeah but i asked about research is what research when it comes to restaurants okay Matia, you're having a saga with these damn these damn restaurant owners. Yeah, man. <laughs> exactly, man. This is the second episode. I was just wondering, man, because like every copywriting course that I've taken, they basically always make examples with coaching, some kind of coaching when it comes to research. So I don't know, personal trainers or mental coaches. And, you know, I get it. Like when it comes to, for example, weight loss, it's kind of intuitive to understand what the frustrations are or the fears, ambitions, and dreams. Like, obviously, like the frustrations are, oh, I can, I'm not um, attractive to the opposite sex or I don't feel healthy and uh, so on and so forth. And the dreams are the opposite. But you know, man, when it comes to restaurants, right? It's hard to apply those four forces because, I mean, 
what can be the frustration if you're talking about veggie burgers I mean, <laughs> or fears, you know, like you really, I don't, I don't think you can play on that that much. Am I wrong? Are you, this is, you're, are you talking to the consumer, like the customer of the restaurant? Or are you talking with the restaurant owner? The consumer, the customer. So I'm writing uh, on behalf of the restaurant to, to them. Uh, yeah. yeah, I look at like I mean, I think there's like there's like so many food forums and like food blogs and cooking blogs and things like that. I mean, I would I would mostly focus on the research there. I mean, if there's any fears, it's, it's like little. I mean, they're not ones I would necessarily bring up to the, the customer. Like there's like the fear that the kitchen's not well, you know, that the kitchen's not clean or that um, you know the ingredients are cheap or that there's a bunch of like, added like additives and fillers and crap, like, you know, like being added to like the, the entree. Um, so I think, you know, you probably could find some interesting stuff there around fear or so by doing research and then, uh, you know, doing that, like there's a, cause you could be like, you know, Hey, here's how we keep our kitchens clean. Right. And do an email about that. And like, basically like, Hey, you ever thought about like seeing the, the kitchen of a re- your favorite restaurant or a restaurant you like, and it kind of creeps you out like us too. And because of that, we really freak out about keeping our kitchen pristine and then like, you know, um, like uh, like like surgical like levels of clean like and here's what we do and like you know that could be an interesting email and that kind of is based around fear so I, I but I would look at yeah you know, like kind of people complaining about restaurants complaining about bad experiences there and then usually the stuff they complain about are probably gonna be related to fears that other people have as well. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. Never thought about it actually. So yeah, although I guess still it's not really. I mean, I don't know, it's very rare, you know, like, I mean, what, what would you do? You go on TripAdvisor or something and look at the negative reviews of certain restaurants. I mean, yeah, I go to like, like Yelp, like Google, like reviews, open table reviews, and like, look at the one star reviews and five star reviews. Hmm. I mean, people, you know, like, people are way more motivated to leave one-star reviews and five-star reviews right like i'm i'm guilty of this i try to be not but it's like i have a great experience and be like that was a great experience and then i'll tell my friends or i'll leave a big tip or something but i don't go leave a review but then like you know if i have a bad really 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 bad experience and i'm like one star here's like my novel like <laughs> like war i'm like i'm like war and pc in that shit you know what i mean i'm like telling like every single thing that happened <laughs> um so i think yeah. that that's a good place to start yeah Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Cool. Happy to help, man. Oh, on the Facebook live side. Hey, uh, Brad Tannenbaum. Hey, Brandon Fredrickson. What's up? What's up? Um, see who else. Next up, we have Mirai about a book recommendation for her from you, Stefan. Ooh. Hey, Malai. Hey, I didn't even want to talk. I just wanted a book recommendation. <laughs> Oh, but it's so good to talk to you. I miss you. I miss you too. I miss your Vegas house. I know. I mean, I'm at it. It's it's great. I know. (laughs) (laughs) You're supposed to be over here by me and you're over back over there again. I know. We're going to be back on Saturday, but yeah. Nice. For eight days and then come back here. But whatever. Yeah. Um, What kind of book recommendations are you looking for? I don't know. Just, you know, I feel like I'm entering a new phase of my life here and as you know, so I felt like I need to read some shit and so <laughs> like you might have some good recommendations based on, you know, the different things that you went through in your life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and so for people who don't know Malai, I mean, a quick, quick, like, Malai, I hired Malai in 2015 as a customer service representative um, for my oh. company. And then Malai transitioned into various roles and then basically help run like affiliate stuff for me. I, mean, you did, I don't know, you did like a ton of different stuff for me. So basically, many things. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, when I started like an agency, um, you know, Malai transitioned over to that with me and helped me run that. And then um, when I was partnered with a friend in another supplement company, we brought Malai over for that. And um, then she's basically turned into the COO and is crushing it, and which is fucking awesome. So to start from hey. customer service in 2015 to like the COO, of, like a, a $20 million company or whatever it is, um, not, not the worst, kind of neat. Uh, that's why I love it. <laughs> um, but as you as you transition, yeah, I mean, I think that books I've been looking at from your perspective and, you know, from an operational, I mean, there's a lot of like the goodies, like the, the, the goodies, but the classics, you know, like I, I 
really like the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. I can't remember if I made you read that or not back in the day. No, I brought it up. I don't think you did. Yeah, I really like that. I think you've got to go through the first, go through the, the first couple of laws and it can feel like there's sort of some like platitudes and stuff. And you're like, but then when you really practice, I, I did that for you, like when we were with our supplement company and you and um and Blake, who was one of our early employees who now is uh, having a lot of success elsewhere. Um, and Malai and Blake like, like hated each other for a period of time. <laughs> it was just funny because we love each other now still. <laughs> I know. There was a kind of, I got like a phone call. I remember I was, in, I went to Coachella. I took like time off for the first time. And I got like a, these worried Slack messages from someone else. So like, <laughs> Malai and Blake are in the hallway of like the Regis co-working space, like screaming at each other. And like- It wasn't even just screaming at each other. It was like, they're cussing each other out. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> yeah. And I flew back and I was like, so, so, so pissed at both of you. Um. But I, I read like the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. And one of the laws that really resonated for me was this idea of um, the law of the inner circle, and, like having this inner circle of people that you trust to get things done. And then for me, that helped me to then to delegate uh, stuff to you and other team members and to help like uh, be like trusting and not, not come in. Because once I started doing that, I found I, like, I can't always come in and make decisions. I need to empower people on my team to make decisions like, like you, Mali. And like, I... And then I would do that. And then you, you and the team would start talking about solutions. And I'd want to come in and be like, oh no, like, uh, like I do it this way. But I, I had to force myself not to do that. And mm-hmm. then I found that like 90% of the time uh, you all came like, uh, you know, you, you all basically came to the same decision I would have made anyway. And then like 8% of the other time you came to a different, you know, kind of conclusion, but it still worked and effective. And maybe like 2% of the time it was something that like wasn't the best decision, but like, that suddenly freed and empowered me so much. And so that book alone, like really just, you know, helped me significantly. So that's one I would really look at reading. Um, awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to say, I mean, it was a, a billion. I love them, but. Um, I just need to like go to your Vegas house and rent some books. Dude, I mean, I'm looking at my bookcase right now and it's just like, just so turned on by it. I love all my books, but um, yeah, start there, I think. Okay, cool. Thanks, Stefan. All right, awesome. Thank you, Malai. Of course. Cool. Okay. Next up, we have Heath about creating your own product. Nice. What's up, Heath? What's up, man? How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So one of the bullets in the email was creating your own product and crushing it as an offer owner. Um, and I was just, you know, I, I run my own seven figure e-commerce brands now, but it's always been like physical products. So I import from China and, and uh, have a team here that self fulfills and stuff. Right. Um, I want to transition to running some info product offers and things like that. I have a couple doctors that want me to write sales letters for them. And so I was just curious, is there any resources in RMBC? If not, what do you recommend? Who do you recommend that I follow? um what i what should you do what should you avoid things like that yeah um i don't have anything really specific about being like an info product offer owner in rmbc uh my friend cody bramlett is actually working on a course it's called like i think he's calling it like supplement millionaire so it's about physical stuff but it is like a really cool kind of like guide of like all the things that go wrong when starting like a supplement business and like how to essentially do that and i think that would be valuable even for people who are uh, going to, you know, do info products. Um, but I would look at like, you know, leveraging RMBC, like the, the Facebook group, um, you know, also Justin seven talk copy. I think you can honestly just like, uh, reach out to different info product offer owners and ask them to pick like a, you know, pick their brain, ask them to kind of just like have like a call or, you know, and I think a lot of them would like, I'm, I'm thinking an RMBC method, like, you know, Brian Casagina is in there and he's, he's a really successful, you know, info product owner and copywriter. Um, and, but there's a lot of others as well. So that'd be the biggest thing I would look at. I, I think um, as far as like the, the do's or don'ts or pitfalls or things of that nature, um, I mean, there's not a ton. Like, I mean, it's, I, there is, but it's the same stuff as of anything really. Uh, it's like getting traffic, like getting affiliates to drive traffic. So trying to get your average order value up as high as you can, because the higher your AOV is, the higher the CPA you can pay. I think generally with info products, I would be looking to break even on the front end and then make money on the back end by monetizing my email list by you know emailing customers and selling them more stuff like whether it's you know your own physical products or as an affiliate i think with um physical product companies you have much more uh like much more of a chance to 
of like, you know, kind of be profitable on day zero, but with info products, it's a lot harder. So I'd be looking more at how to like, um, just get enough, like, you know, you can do like a thousand buyers a day, um, and, you know, do that sustainably for, you know, like whatever, like six months, right. That's like 180,000 buyers on a list that that list is worth two to $5 million a year to you probably at least for the next year. Um, so that's the way I would, and that pretty much at all profit. Um, so that can be one of my biggest focuses. Cool. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. My pleasure. By the way, I know there's someone in the chat, uh, Tanya, who isn't exactly sure how she got here and what she's, uh, doing. It looks like I'm kind of half seeing it, but Tanya, I don't know how you got here either, but you know, thanks for being here. Glad to have yeah, you. So, so I, she got an email from you and it's not my uh, list. So that's yeah, so hard. she was asking like what what we do business, and I was like a little confused because I'm like I'm not really sure how somebody can be on the show and not know at least what you do if they come from your email list. But hey, the more the merrier, you know. That's awesome. I might be new to my email list, and this is one of the first emails, and she decided to come. Ah, that's awesome. I get it turns out I do get I get about twenty to thirty new people on my list every day, sometimes more. So. Really? Wow, yeah. Stephen, oh, look at you go. go. Yeah. Good. Big boy, big boy. Okay. I know. I know. Big boy. <laughs> but. All right. So next up, we have a question from Nicholas about hiring. Sweet. Nicholas, what's up? Let's do it. Hey, Stefan. How you doing? Good. And you? Doing great. Cool. Um, yeah. So I run a social media marketing agency. It's going really, really well. Um, I help a lot of different people, mainly helping um, people that have info products. So that last question, cause I, I want to do my own product after helping so many people with their stuff. It's like, I want to do my own. So that last question was cool, but right now it's in order to keep scaling this current business, I've gotten to the point where I'm just getting burned out with the amount of work that I do. Right. So hiring. Um, I have two people right now they're doing well, but I just am looking for any insight on like just being a good leader who do I need to hire or not who, just how, how to do it right and how to manage them correctly in order to keep growing. Yeah, man, that's a great question. And in the common question, I mean, so who are the two, like what roles do the two people have who you've hired so far? Yeah. So one of them is just kind of like manager. Um, she just helps like organize my day, organize the flood of emails that I get. Um, just kind of do like daily ads check-ins for me, just, just kind of oversee stuff. Um, and then the other guy that I've hired, um, he's more of like, I guess the best way to describe him is like a, um, a junior ads guy. Um, so I'm trained, he doesn't really know too much about Facebook ads and, and media buying in general, but I'm training him up slowly, but surely. And, and, um, he's going to actually help like you know, fully manage the accounts or when I get a new account, um, he'll be able to go in there himself and, you know, deploy new copy if he needs to, um, cut ads, scale ads, do all that fun stuff that, that I know how to do. Yeah, makes sense. And so within the agency right now, as a lot of you're doing kind of like doing the the media buying for these info product owners. So like, you know, driving traffic and stuff like that for them. Yeah, a lot, a lot of what I'm doing is just managing everything, writing copy, doing the audience research, doing the fancy Facebook tricks to make sure things scale correctly. And, and if they're not doing well, cut them and how to come back from it. And then a, another big piece of it is just calls with clients. Like a lot of my clients want to have calls with me throughout the week. Yeah. optimize and scale and i've definitely cut back a lot um since the past few months but it's that's probably one of the biggest things that take up my time is they just want to talk to me and i've told them like hey i can sure we can talk that's great but i mean i could rather spend time just making you more money you know talking isn't right. necessarily going to make you money um i mean sure it's totally fine to talk sometimes but yeah th those are the two things yeah it makes sense that's that's pretty common too i mean as far as them wanting to get on the phone with you I think what you have to do though, uh, I mean, one of the things would be, you know, getting that like client success manager who's like their liaison and who is the person they, they do talk to. I mean, that person schedules like a weekly or bi-weekly call and there's a cadence. I think when you do that, you'll get some resistance from some of your clients early on. Um, but I think you have to do that because otherwise uh, like, you know, you, that's the thing, right? Cause you can't be trading. It's not, you're not even trading time for money. You're trading time and not making money. So it's like the worst, yeah. right? Cause like, it's one thing to trade time for money, which is cool, but like you want to get away from that, which is why you start an agency. But now it's like you're just trading time, not for money. Um, and so for anyone new you bring on, I think having like a dedicated client success manager, somebody whose job is to basically take them through like an onboarding process with their SOPs, but then also be like, again, have like a cadence and a regular sort of call 
Um, I think that's a really important move. Um, you know, as far as hiring goes in general, like, I guess like, you know, this is the, the platitude of uh, like, you know, hire slow and fire fast. And I do think that that's pretty accurate. Doing, um, doing personality tests is really helpful. Like doing like the 16 personalities test or something like that uh, to where you can look at like the kind of the, like the makeup of like who they are, right? Because I think if, by doing that, you can see, are you hiring somebody who's got the exact same personality as you or do they have, you know, a person, like if you're hiring for like a client success manager and they're like super introverted and like turbulent, you're like, eh, I don't know, is that the right role? Um, you know, you can go deeper with that, but things of that nature, looking at personality profiles and things like that can, can really help too. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And um, if, if if you can, with that last question, like it, and one, with one of your emails you recently sent out with the sh like shiny object syndrome, is me trying to start like do my own product? Do you think that's like good to do or not? Because like with so many people that I help with info products, like gosh, I want to do my own info product because <laughs> I know how to do it, you know. Yeah. But I just don't know if I should take my focus away from everything else or how to choose a product. Yeah. No, I. It's up to you what you want to do, but probably you shouldn't do it. Probably okay. if you like if you like the agency and you really want to grow it and scale it. I mean, I think about like I've been. I'm doing a bunch of one-on-one uh, -on -one stuff with um, a guy named like Alex Ramosi, which some of you guys might know who that is. And he basically, yeah. yeah so he basically hired me to like help him uh, teach him like RMBC, like kind of private one-on-one. -on -one. So we just had a call this morning too. Um, but like, if you look at like, you know, Alex is like the guy built like, you know, like a hundred million dollar agency essentially by doing like lead gen for gyms. And then now he's helping all these people to do, you know, 250 to, you know, million dollars plus per month as agency owners. So I'm not sure where you're at revenue wise, but like probably there's like a lot further you could go. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so, you know, if you enjoy that aspect of it and the agency is going well now and you're not overly stressed, um, then I would just stick with that. If you, you know, the, like, cause otherwise, yeah, you're gonna get distracted and start doing the offer ownership and you put resources into that and the agency is not gonna grow as much. Then you're gonna feel like the agency is kind of like a burden, but you can't really stop doing it because that's what's bringing in the money. You know what I mean? There's just like a lot of tension there. Um, yeah. you know, if you want to build that agency to where it is completely like automated and like you're like, it's so like all the SOPs are in place, the systems, the processes and everything else to where it's so dialed in that you are not even like a part of it, then you could do the info products in, but I would make it a goal to build the agency um, to be like that if you want to then go do other things. Otherwise, so I would just focus on the agency. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I appreciate it. it means a lot. Yeah, Happy to help. Cool. Bada bing, bada boom. I do want to just answer what happened to Logan because I know Logan got upvoted. Gurleen asked, this is gonna be, I'm not, I'm not gonna bring her on live for this one, but I'll just answer really quickly. So for those of you who don't know. Like, um, like, like Logan Paul, you mean? No, you know, we mean Logan on my Netflix account. So basically I logged into Netflix and I've got oh. my Netflix account and then Bobby Wilkinson, like Chef Bobby and his wife, Melissa have been on my Netflix account for like a year and a half or two years now. Cause like I stayed at their house for a summer when we like first moved to Vegas. And so they have one. In fact, like it was like Bobby's birthday and like Melissa got him like a new, like, I don't know, like a new Kindle or tablet or something. And she like literally messaged Laura like, Hey, do you guys change the password? Cause I'm trying to get Bobby, <laughs> like, you know, get Netflix set up for Bobby. So they're on, which is fine. I knew that was on there, but then I logged in the other day and there was like a Logan was on there too. Um, and so Gurleen's wondering, I don't know who the F Logan is. So, you know, Gurleen's asking the hard hitting and important questions of if Logan is still on my Netflix account. And the answer is yes, Logan's still there. I don't know if you guys can see, Logan's got a little avatar right there. Um, I have not removed Logan. I'm gonna tell you guys what Logan's up to. Logan is primarily watching kids stuff and then lately a lot of Christmas uh, kind of things here. But Logan is for sure, um, you know, probably like 14, maybe even like 12 or 10. So Logan's most recent watches include Liar Liar Vampire from Nickelodeon. Um, a Babysitter's Guide to Monster Hunting. It's a good Victorious, movie. which is also a Nickelodeon thing. My Babysitter, a Vampire. So apparently you guys a theme kind of going on here. Um, well, I says it's Ed. <laughs> My Kids 4D. Okay, that's a good movie though. That's a good movie though. Okay, okay. Mr. Peabody and Sherman show. Um, Power mm -hmm. Rangers Dino or something like that. Bunked. 
Shark Boy and Lava Girl. That's a great movie too. That's a really good movie. Okay. All right. So basically what we're saying is Logan's got pretty good taste here. Or what we're saying is Logan is Ed. That's that's what Malai is saying. <laughs> he watched uh, or he watched Casper, the Christina Ricci version. Secret He's got Egg taste. He's got taste too. Yeah. Stephen. Logan's solid. So I mean I think that knowing that Log- Logan is like probably like some like 12 year old like semi hacker kid who just found some database of hacked passwords and you know got on my Netflix like yeah, I hope Logan enjoys. You know what I Are mean? Are you sure it's not just um, your friend's like cousin who they like, you know, accidentally gave the password to to be like, oh, can you help me set up my thing? And then they like, like, I could like, I don't know how old your friends are, but like, I don't know. Like, if I was a mischievous kid and, you know, my grandma was like, hey, like, can you help me set up my Apple TV with Netflix? I'd be like, okay, what's your password? And then we'll set it up. And I'd be like, oh, there's space for one more. And then, you know, <laughs> I would get, go in there. <laughs> you know, it's possible, but like, I was sort of into like, I wanted to be like a quasi like hacker when I was like, you know, 11, 12, 13, because- <laughs> It's a communist like, spy. <laughs> I was also like growing up, like with like, inter- you know, the internet was just like, I mean, I, you know, to sound, here's me sounding old, even though at the, you know, age of 35, I still feel like I'm, like basically Ed's age, but um, I still can't get over the fact that you're 35. I thought, you, like, I always thought, you know, like 30, 31, know. 32. Yeah. Make me feel young. You're a, um, you're a young man. Like I remember, like I remember, you know, when my dad brought home the internet. Like my dad brought home AOL, and like I knew it was gonna happen. I remember being at school in Maryland before I moved to California in like third grade and talking with my friend Mike Herman and talking about like we we're talking about what our screen names were gonna be. And I picked like this really stupid screen name, and he was like, what his was gonna be, and then. You know, my dad like plugged in, like, like literally my dad brought home the internet. The internet, we didn't have the internet and then we had it, which is like anyone who's my age or older probably like totally like kind of knows what I'm talking about. But then for like people who are like, you know, I feel like today kids now, they're like, it's hard to even imagine that that's a thing. It's like the internet's sort of always been there um, and it's gotten mm-hmm. better, right? But like, I remember, yeah, it's like my old timey shit. So um, with that being said, by the way though, then I was on AOL. So I was like trying to search for like boobs and stuff like that. But like, it was like the safe search was on. And then I realized it was like web crawler or whatever. You could get off AOL and I searched for boobs and it was like, holy shit. Like, oh my God. And then I saw some stuff and I was like, I don't know. I might go back to the safe search because this is getting, you know, like I'm, I'm 11 or 12. Like this is a little too much for me, but. Um, Bro, lucky, lucky for you, man. Like, yeah, Jesus. Yeah. I did not have the same fate after searching that at a much younger age. And that, yeah. that led well, me to that path. Stefan waiting 17 hours for boobs to load. I know. It was like, you know, when there was like the like like the line comes down like this, like you get the top of the boob, and then it's like a few minutes later, like you know, you get a little bit further down. Um so, yeah. yeah. Those are the those are the days. Oh my god. So you know? There's no magic anymore. Now it's, it's too easy, too easy to see boobs these days, you know? Um Yeah, OnlyFans, bro. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I gotta subscribe to yours that I keep meaning. Yeah, I know, dude. You keep you keep putting it off. Okay. So you, you tell me you're gonna buy my compliance course and then you don't do it. And sure. you tell me you're gonna subscribe to my OnlyFans and then you don't do it. What what I'm running a you know, discount right now for my OnlyFans, okay, bro? Thank you, Michael McGovern, for shouting that out. Okay. You no, know, look, one booty pick a week, eleven eleven a month. Look, I keep it affordable for the for the homies. I keep it affordable for the homies, okay? I look, appreciate that. I'll, 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 give, I'll give you I'll give you the the, the classic I am pitch for, for why I uh, lowered the rate because look I don't want price to be the reason why you can't enjoy yourself you know I don't want you know your okay. the dollar value to be between you and your happiness okay dude I appreciate that sorry Julia so you can hear just dying laughing over the is, that, is that Julia yeah yeah what's um, up Julia how's it going <laughs> Um, uh, I'm very upset because Stefan is not has not yet subscribed to my OnlyFans. Bro. Well, here's here's the creepy thing. I do want to go back to questions in a second, but um, so I didn't buy your compliance course, but I just paid you several thousand dollars to do the do it for me. So if I don't subscribe to your OnlyFans, I don't know, like you know, I just have to like I have to pay for like one night with Ed Ray, you know, where I come and you just do this model for me the whole night. Is that a thing? You know, um, little bikini pics. Do I get that, or how does that work, bro? For a few grand, I'll do whatever you want. Let's Q and A. Let's back to Q and A here. Okay. Who else we got? Yo, seven. I bet you. I bet you would hire me for like a lower, like one night with Ed rate, and be like, yeah, sit here and do my Facebook compliance for me. I mean, yeah, that's definitely what I would do. I would be like, <laughs> like you know, those services where like creepy old men like hire like maids and like lingerie to clean, but then like they're really like trying to like 
you know, get with them. It's like if I ever did yeah. that, I'd be like, dude, you missed the spot. Like I don't like I mean, okay. They put a shirt on. I got this on my house clean. You know, it's similar. Same thing with like the OnlyFans stuff. Um, hey man, I've always wanted to be a pool boy. I think I could do pretty well with that. You know what, man? There's still time. So, okay. What's that? Ew, Luffy. Luffy said Ed in a French maid costume. I don't, want, I don't want that visual. I don't want that visual in my head. Yeah, no, bro. Luffy, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. No, no I, <laughs> I, I have some self-respect, okay? Anyway, um, so Amon has a question about launching a GoFundMe. Nice. What's up, Amon? Or Eamon? Is it Eamon or yeah, it's, it's Eamon. Thank cool. you. Eamon. How are you doing, Stefan? Good, man. Good, good. Yeah, so my question is basically, um, so I'm launching a GoFundMe and we're doing this for my brother. So I'm sure you're, uh, you're probably not familiar, but he has a pretty rare disease called Gaucher type three. And this year has been really difficult for people that are um, special needs. And so he's, he's nonverbal autistic and, you know, pe- being locked inside has been really difficult. So we want to do something special for him for Christmas and for next year. So could because th- this could be his last Christmas. He has a pretty rare disease that essentially, um, well, I'll give you, I'll just give you the, it's hard to summarize. So I'll just give you the full sure. story. Um, so it's Gaucher type three. It's a neurological degenerative disease where every human has fatty tissue in their body called lipids. And he lacks an enzyme that breaks down those lipids called, he lacks an enzyme called glucose cerebrosidase. Yeah. So they accumulate in his major organs and eventually they break down those organs. So he's over the past few years, he's developed like epilepsy and autism. He's lost his ability for like walking, talking, eating, you know, things that I previously would take for granted. And so that's, that's also the reason that I ended up starting uh, my agency in the past two years. And it's why I, I work very hard, but I'm not able to do the really magical things that I want to do for my family just yet. So for that reason, we're going to be launching a GoFundMe. And my question is, when you're writing and you're doing a nonprofit or, or a GoFundMe, would you recommend that the emotion you lead with is negative, where you're talking about how things have been devastating? You know, you think about those um, the donations where they ask you to feed the starving kids in Africa, and it shows these really ter- like terrible pictures. Or do you believe that it, it would be just as powerful or more powerful to go positive and tell a story of of triumph and victory? of conquering so that's my question dude um i'm sorry you know, to hear that your your brother's going through that and, and i know how i don't i mean i don't know from that perspective but having you know had family challenges of health and stuff like that you know it's, it sucks but um yeah that's tough dude i mean i i want to i want to believe that both can work i really do um but i think if you look at it empirically generally like the more emotional heart like you know gut-wrenching type of stuff is going to do better I think the biggest thing too is honestly to put it into it's like it's like it's like your brother's story but it's also getting people to imagine that it's their brother or their child or their son you know what I mean and so it's sort of like you know imagine like um imagine like looking at you know your son or like you know some other young person in your life and thinking that this could be their last Christmas. You know what I mean? Like something like that is like a first line and like, you know, kind of talking about the story of your brother. And then, and I think you can, you can marry both for sure. I mean, I think you can have the inspirational side of it too, but I think talking about sort of like, you know, that's the story of, you know, uh, your brother's name and like sort of a little bit of the background. And then like, you know, think about it, think about if you were in his situation, think about like, you know, again, like, like make people think about it and, um, and like, and, and, and put themselves and like, imagine that they're in your brother's shoes. And like, um, you know, I mean, everyone's afraid, not everyone, most people are afraid of, of dying and afraid of death and afraid of losing their health and things like that. And like, they don't think about it most of the time because they're afraid of it. But when you force somebody to confront that or to put themselves in the shoes of somebody who's facing it, um, it freaks them the fuck out, but that's good. Right. It, it also motivates them to want to like actually, you know, take action. Um, so I think if you do that stuff and then, and it's sort of like, And then from there, like in the arc, go to like the hope, like the triumph. I mean, like the inspiration and who he is, what he's doing and the opportunity to like, you know, give him this, this, this moment, the special thing. Like, I think, um, that's the way I would approach that. Also, obviously 
like uh like send me the link once it's up because i'll you know happy to like contribute to that but um yeah does that, help? does that make sense yeah so what i'm hearing is to write the story in almost first person from the reader's point of view and just put them in the shoes instead of because they may not care about my story but they would care if it was their story Sounds yeah nice. so like imagine if this was your story and sort of tell them then you tell them the story of of you or your brother or either i mean i think your brother right but then i mean you as as someone looking on this person you love and be like and then ask them can they relate can they think of that can they understand how painful that would be you know what i mean like again make them right like, so you can tell, still tell his story but then you're, you're basically taking them and telling them to put themselves in, in your shoes or your brother's shoes and really you know see themselves in there um and i think that's really like uh you know, that, that's going to be the most effective thing, I think. Because if you tell his story, people are like, oh, man, that sucks, but I just don't have the money, right? But, like, if you tell mm -hmm. this story that they see themselves in, and it's like they're almost, like, donating to save themselves, you know what I mean? Like, as weird as it sounds, like, psychologically. So it just makes a big difference, I think. Have you, um, are, are you and Justin Stefan talk copy, by the way? Pardon? Are you and Justin and Stefan talk copy, like, the Facebook group? I am. Okay, are you on Justin Goff's email list? I am. Okay, cool. So he has, um, I think he's shown some uh, like emails or not emails, uh, like sales letters, like direct mail that he's written uh, for nonprofits for um, uh, raising donations for, I think it was a Great, great Dane. Uh, yeah, thank you. Fundraising letter for nonprofit for Great Danes. Um, I think... It, you could probably find a lot of inspiration from um, getting access to those letters. Um, if you can't find it in the Facebook group, I definitely recommend you post and ask people for help. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, good, good suggestion. Ed, and other people in the chat too. For sure. Cool, Eamon. Keep us, keep us posted, dude. Dude, thank you so much for your work. Yeah, absolutely, man. All right, next up, we have Max Uria about his massive mental block. What up, Max? What's up, Max? Stefan? What's up? Man? How are you? Fine? Good, good. Yeah. Doing great. Better, better now that you're here. No, no, just kidding. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> no, this is making a stupid <laughs> joke, but yeah, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for answering Eamon's question. I, I was going to tell you. If you gave me the term before and I was, I was please answer his question because it was super inspiring. So absolutely, I hope it goes well for you, Amen. So after that, I'm just going to share a little bit um, of background behind the question, which is, should I focus more on re developing the relationship with a client or should I just, um, for example, try to Bring, uh, give him value by providing copy, but but giving uh, charging for it if he likes it. Because, as you may know or remember, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, I used your um, free copy reach out technique, and I sent some Facebook ads to, uh, to a very well known celebrity and uh, celebrity now very well known Facebook ad expert here in Europe. So he really liked the copy and everything. He even gave me access uh, to one of his courses in exchange for my copy because of the reciprocity, you know, and also yeah. gave me some, some insider access to his mastermind for a couple of days. But since that, I was wondering, um, should I focus on providing more free copy to him to develop the relationship, even though that may position me as a cheap copywriter or an an expert copywriter since I'm actually a beginner. I've just been doing this for six months and I haven't done some paid work for it. So, or should I write a, a huge bundle for him on whatever he needs it or a sales letter for his mastermind, which he doesn't have and price it or charge for it if he likes it? What would you do, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's tough for me not knowing, you know, a lot about him. Um, you did the technique, he you know, reciprocated, which is good. Um, you've got a bit of a relationship going now, but he hasn't. He likes right, but he hasn't, you know, asked you to, and when you did the technique, I mean, did you, 
you know, did you kind of say, and by the way, if you like this, like, you know, I'm a copywriter and I'd love to write more. I literally, Stefan, I literally copied your words and it worked fantastically. He told me, I really like you. And I would, um, I would like to know your, um, your fees for, for future projects. So I told him, I told him the fees and I had some, like, m maybe it's some mental BS for me, but I told him like, I, I'll write a 20 pack Facebook ad for you for uh, 1,250 euros. Mm. And I, I don't know if, if that was mental blocks for me or, or limiting beliefs because I have never charged for it before. And that's why a few weeks ago, I also asked you, oh, do you think it's a lot of money if I charge 125 euros for a, for a, a Facebook ad or something? Right. So he actually liked the copy. He told me, I'm, I'm impressed by your copy, which actually boosted my confidence a little bit because if it wasn't for that, I would have charged you just like 500 euros. <laughs> so, so just uh, what, what would you do? Would you write copy and tell him, hey, hey, do you like it? If you like it, um, just pay me this. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine. We'll keep working together and maybe tell me some projects you're working on to see if I can provide some value. I don't know. I think if it was me, I try to keep the relationship up and going, obviously. I would like consider, you know, putting like um, every now and then, like you do that, like, hey, like, uh, you know, by the way, I was checking this out and saw like, you know, you're running this ad and thought it was cool. Like, here's a variant that I thought you could test. Like you could throw that stuff every now and then, but once you've done it once, I don't like to keep, you know, continue to do it for free to build a relationship to me. I mean, it's probably not a great idea. I, again, I don't know enough about this person. Like, you know, like if you like, say you, this is a completely like, obviously like weird hypothetical example. You did like Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos is like, hey, I like that, you know, hey, you check out like, you know, some whatever and you're like, oh, cool. And then like, you know, then they, and you really want to get in that guy's inner circle, right? Like then I'm like, maybe you keep doing that a bit. And I think that can have, but there is the, the danger is to your point and you're smart enough to recognize it is that you don't want them to, you don't want them to start associating you with like free copy where it's like, this is great. This guy just keeps giving me like free stuff. Yeah. And like, you know, um, awesome. Uh, But, you know, at the same time, you know, the relationship is valuable. You have an in right there. I'm kind of a little torn. And Ray, like, I want to know what you think. I feel like I'm going to nail this, this answer. Well, <clears throat> it kind of depends on who they are and, like, how big they are. If you're just dealing with some Joe Schmo, like, then whatever. Like You feature just... on, like, Forbes Marketing 30 Under 30. So kind of like Sam Ovens, sort of say. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to give you some context frankly that yeah. doesn't usually mean much it just means that they paid for it um straight up i mean obviously there's, there's exceptions but a lot of the time that kind of publication is paid for um okay. i know seven's wincing but well again, the 30 under 30 i don't think you pay for that but you have pr people help you I mean, you pay yeah. for it indirectly but guess what you know the same reason that i got featured in forbes and uh inc and business insider and all that but it's like i didn't pay for the placements or anything like that but yeah. it's But you you have a PR people who help, but then you have to actually have stuff. So I don't I don't. There are you can get like you can straight up pay for Forbes features for sure. But that's yeah. from the 30 under 30. If he's featured in the Forbes 30 under 30, he probably didn't pay for that. That's like legit. That's cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. Anyways, but it depends what you want out of this relationship with this person. Like, if this is somebody who you want like a long term relationship with, not just as a client but as a mentor. And somebody that you want to work with for the long term and you really respect them and you want to really be like them and they're in a place that you want to be or you want to learn from, then maybe putting in, you know, working for free for quite a while would work really well. So let me let me give you an example. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember uh, Ron Lynch. He uh, yeah. well, he came on the show a month or two ago. And he was just kick ass, most insane guy. He's so smart. He's so interesting. Got so much experience. If I was starting out from scratch, I would work for him for free for like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six months. What? Because I, I worked for six months for free before I got my old job. Um, With Dan. Sure. But uh, I would definitely do that. Um, if you're looking for like a long-term mentorship, like be okay with working for free for a bit. Obviously don't let people take advantage of you. There's a lot of really shitty people out there who will, you know, take advantage of free services. So be very, very smart about who you give that to. 
Um, but on the other hand, I don't want that to be an excuse for you not charging. I get you. So kind of like don't lose confidence in myself, but totally the dude told you your copy is good. I mean, if, if they say that that's probably means that they like you enough that they would pay you. Um, so what's, what's your big, like, what would you say? Like your, your actual big block here is like mentally. I'm just um, thinking like, because, you know, neediness is needy is creepy, you know? Sure. So I, I'm not like in a need for money, right? Like I'm your age. I live with my, with my family, with my mom here and she, we're fine with the money. So I don't have to go to sites like Upwork or something like that and find low paying, for example, jobs or, or even high, pay, high paying jobs, but, but I can develop relationships with people that are better connected with me and can represent like a, a big um, big added value in the future, like with the connections he may have and the connections that I may, I may create in, with his mastermind or other um, integrants of his groups, right? So uh, that's the only thing I was kind of wondering because I was thinking if I charge for it, because, you know, in the end, we all have this, like, this uh, erotic dream of, oh, I'm finally going to get paid for my first project. So, but am I undercharging for it? Will he think I'm an idiot or a cheap bastard? And will he just ignore me because th he will just think, oh, this guy is so needy. I don't want to work with him, you know? Okay, so, so uh, <clears throat> what, what part of this interaction do you see as being needy? Um, maybe that's just a block, mental block for me, but since I reached out to him, providing some free like samples for him, and mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't asked uh, me to work on any project yet, that may, that doesn't mean he's not going to do it in the future. But if I, I, I was just thinking, okay, so if I write some copy for him and just ask for some money in exchange for it, I think that may be fine, but I just want it like, you know, to be sure that's not going to look like, or uh, damage the relationship, right? Kind of like for money. Hey, I did this, but if you like it, give it some, give me some money, <laughs> you know? So yeah. So it sounds like to me, um, so has the dude tried the free copy that you made? He, he's going to try it now because he was running some a Black Friday campaign and he just yeah. finished. Mm -hmm. So I was just waiting for the results. And I know that if he has the results and they are good, it's way easier for him to ask me to do a yeah. project, right? Yeah. Okay. So this, this becomes very simple to me. It's just you wait for the results to come back. And then when he goes, hey, you know, the results were A, B, and C, then you charge him for, uh, you know, the next batch of stuff. Okay, cool. And if the results are shit, I just write some copy for him and send it for him to test. And and if he likes it, just well, if the results it. if the results are shit, do you think he's gonna want <laughs> you to write for him again? <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> so then you just move on. You learn from it, and move on. So abundance. either way, you win. Yeah, just have that abundance mindset and not be not be scarce. Yeah. That's so cool. This is like having a private mentorship with you guys. You're amazing. Thank you. You got it, man. Yeah. You're Have it all, man. Ed Ray, good job. Good job there, man. Thank you. That was good. I was like, I was kind of struggling, but I like that. I like that to show too. It's like, if I don't have the right answer rather than just sort of pretend, I'm like, ah, fuck, maybe Ed knows. And you didn't know. It'd be great. You'd be surprised. Like, no, when people ask these questions, like they, they don't ask for my opinion for the most, most of the time. So I just like, oh, okay. This is my um, show but like yeah exactly right. exactly, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah exactly it is your show yeah so i'm like okay cool but like i, I always got some i usually got something to share and um I, okay question here from dev devam devam about uh how to approach editing what's up devam hey how you doing i'm great how are you doing doing awesome thank you man this year i have to say one of the best things that happened to me this year was coming across your stuff no, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, so my question was, uh, after you go through the first draft, after you write the first draft, how do you approach editing? Like, what do you look at first? How do you change stuff? How do you think about this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
what I realize I do is like, I don't like editing while writing a lot, but um, I will sometimes when I, as I'm writing, I'll actually, and I think uh, Steve Gunn pointed this out to me for the first time, but like, I will, um, before I start writing, like for a new session, I'll kind of read what I've written so far and I'll just tidy up and clean stuff as I'm going. So I'll take like, you know, depending on how much has been written, like 10 to 30 minutes to sort of read through it and I'll tighten up a little senses and just sort of tweak and then get to like the end of it and then start writing from there. Um, and the reason that I bring that up is because that actually helps me a lot to, it cuts down on my editing time pretty significantly um, because I'm sort of editing a little bit like at the beginning of each session. Um, so I think that helps. Beyond that, what am I really looking for? I'm looking for like, you know, like the flow, like all the transitions between different sections, people just tend to screw those up. Um, I'm looking for simplicity. Is it like, is everything simple and easy to understand? Are there parts that are complicated? Um, are there parts that are like repetitive? Are there parts that are, you know, boring or um, confusing or just unnecessary? Um, and, you know, I'm kind of, if, I, if there are, trying to clean that stuff up as well. Um, you know, I'm looking at my, my checklist for my kind of my copy outline and I'm looking at maybe things like, for example, I, you know, I love fascinations or curiosity bullets. And so if I go through the lead of something I've written and realize that there's not any fascinations in there, then I might be like, oh, I'm gonna try to add some of those in and I'll like add those in. Or if I'm like, oh, you know, I don't really spend a lot of time uh, building up the price before I reveal what the price is or building up the value before I reveal what the price is. I'm like, oh, I should add that in. So I kind of, then I go back and refer to my, my checklist and see if there's any I, mean, I kind of do it honestly, like like mentally, without having to refer to the checklist because I know it in my head. But um, but yeah, those are the big things. But clarity, flow, stuff like that, just easy. Like if I'm and, and honestly, one of the best things for editing is to like read out loud. Like if you can read your copy out loud, if you don't do that, it's so helpful because then you'll just find that you stumble over things that maybe you know they flowed great for you, but you read out loud and you're like, oh, what? And you stumble. And if you're stumbling, then other people will stumble. So. Those are the big things I do. Yeah, one last thing. Uh, before you send a, send a piece of copy over to a client, how do you judge if it's like good enough? At a certain point, you just have to trust the process and let go. You know what I mean? Because you're never, you're never sure if it's like good enough or not. You know? and, you, and the thing you think about, and this, it helps ex with experience, but like, um, you know, it's like, there's things that I've written that I think are just like the greatest thing ever that like didn't do that great or they did like, okay. And there's stuff that I wrote that I'm like, eh, I don't know. And then like that, like crushes, you know? Um, so, uh, so really, if you follow the process, if you've got all the right elements in place, if you're, you know, like using the right structure, all those sorts of things. And, you know, the odds of it, like, you know, being uh, at least like, you know, like good enough are, are much higher. And then there's definitely the odds that it can be, you know, better than good enough and be like really great and excellent. Okay. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, man. Happy to help. Next up, got a question from James about uh, how to sell clients courses. What's up, James? And I do have an answer for this, by the way. Okay. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, thanks for taking this question. Uh, so I have a, we have a potential client that could be coming on and, you know, they're a, they're a coach with a course and, um, I'm trying to, I'm wondering the best way to, uh, efficiently go through a course to gather up, you know, all like the features, benefits, things that we need to effectively sell the course. And I was wondering if I can get you all the advice on that. Sweet. Um, Ed, you want me? We can both go on fire for that. You want to go first and you go, or you want to go first, Ed? You go right ahead. Okay. What's okay. your show? It is my show. <laughs> but, you know, it wouldn't be my show without you, Ed. It would um, be, bro. Come on. I don't know, man. Shit, I think Ed, you, the people are really, they're here for Ed, right? Um, you know, it's true. It's true. Um, James, yeah. So if I was going to go through the course, um, I would look at. Is it like video course? Is it video or is it written? The course content. It'd be it'd be video, like a mix of both. It's like an yeah. average course. So I mean, I'd be going through. All I really do is I like I go through and look at like the kind of the contents, like like the outline, like what are the things that are covered, 
Um, and then I would like go through stuff and just basically try to pull like fascinations from every module or section. So it'd be like, you know, section two, how to X, Y, Z, you know, inside this, you're going to discover blah, 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 blah. Cause like really a lot of selling courses is, is like fascinations and curiosity bullets. Um, you know, but then I would tie it back to whatever the big promises and like the unique mechanism of how the core, cause in the, the copy, you're like promising that they're going to get some kind of like result or resolution from, from their pain point. And then you're basically telling them how, um, you know, like the real reason they haven't gotten the result so far and how, you know, this, you've discovered a new way that will get them results when other things have failed. And then like the program is basically the embodiment of that new way. It shows them how to use the new way to get results for themselves. And because of that, um, you know, you're going to tell them all about the course and, you know, here's what's included, like logical step-by-step -step curiosity and fascinations. And then, um, you know, tying it back to like, remember, like, this is why this fits with the unique mechanism I share. This is why this will work when other things haven't. Um, this is why this gets you, you know, to the solution that I've promised that it'll get you to. Um, so just tying it all back to that. That's, that's my answer. But then I want to give a, I'm going to pass the, the douchey, the douchey, whatever the duchy, you know, how's the song go? Pass <laughs> into the, the duchy. <laughs> duchy. Um, and pass the duchy over to Ed Ray. Have you heard that's that song, right. Ed? It's about passing <laughs> a blunt. It's much like, kid, like Jamaican kids singing this song about passing a blunt around, but yeah. I thought, I thought you were going to be like, pass the douche torch to Ed. I was like, oh, thanks. I'm already holding it. So I've done this with a lot of clients because I really worked in um, uh, just with a lot of info marketers. And one thing like to, I have a few things. So one thing, like Stefan said, fascinations, like literally anytime, like you have like an interesting fact, like a, like, something you think you could write a fascination from, like just literally take insanely vigorous notes, like take insanely vigorous notes and put a timestamp on each um, one. And then after that, go back and then write a bunch of fascinations for each bullet. And then you just pick one, pick a bunch and use those. That's, that's, that's one very important thing to do. Um, it also saves you a lot of time in the future if you want to go back and like rewatch things. The other thing is to um start thinking about your marketing argument and like your big idea um while you're going through the course uh okay. the other thing is to look at um what really makes the course unique and different and then how can you play that up in your marketing message because like you know there's a lot of info courses out there like what makes this one different um so for example i was i was doing um Ian Stanley's, um, I was working for him for a while. Uh, I was on his team. So I think we were doing his ultimate persuasion workshop, which is like a $300 upsell or something like that. Um, and we were going to sell that and it's like a writing workshop. And so what, like the one thing that I found super, super interesting was his second self meditation to like write faster and be more persuasive basically. So we made that like the core hook of it just that one bit right so i think that's something to look at for sure is like what is different about your client's course and what methodologies principles or mechanisms are different and uh start to write down hooks and angles as they come to you while you're going through the course that's definitely my best advice for you awesome hey thank you guys so much yeah awesome. that helps a lot Cool. Glad it helps. Ed Ray, want to go to rapid fire? We saw a lot of, a lot of questions here. Okay. Uh, here we go from anonymous attendee. Hey, Stefan and Ed, I just started freelancing full time recently. I noticed that December is a little slow in general. One of the slow and peak periods for copywriting, how should I approach different periods in uh, terms of reaching out to gigs or clients? Yeah. Good question. Um, the second half of December is really slow. The first half actually can be pretty good. Um, the good thing there is to think about like, you know, depending on your niche, if people are trying to get stuff like launched for the new year, um, you know, you'll have an opportunity to pick up business there. Like I got hired for like two letters of a client and then they're like, oh, we've got this like carnivore, as a carnivore offer I, I wrote for. And like, they basically were like, we want to get it out by January 1st because, you know, new year, everyone's trying to lose weight. So then they, they just, you know, it turned into like a third, um, like kind of client um but so you know honestly i'm a believer that like 
are there slow times? I guess I, uh, but I don't know. I, I just go back to this because people say this is the same thing with like um, a lot of direct response stuff. Like um, people talk about like, December being slow for health supplement companies, right? And like, then you're like, sure, it's slower. So I guess like, you know, Golden Hippo, instead of doing like, you know, $30 million this month is only gonna do $25 million. So they can do $25 million this month and that's their slow month. Then, and you're doing like $500,000 then you don't need to be worrying about it being slow or not. You need to worry about getting more traffic and getting more penetration. And I kind of feel the same way with freelancing as well. Um, like, I just think that like, there's not really slow times um, or even if there are for some people, like I think you should, your mindset should be that you're immune to that. Like, I, like that's, that's sort of my mindset on it. I really think that's the mindset you should have as well. Um, and what was the second part of that question? Uh, let's go back a second here. Uh, how should I, uh, uh, basically how to, how to switch your approach in different periods of times? I mean, I keep rocking. The way that I think about it is if there's certain things that the market wants, it depends on your market. But like, for example, again, if you do stuff with like, you know, like, like we do weight loss, then new year's is great. But so summer, like, Hey, everyone's trying to get like bikini shape and look good. And like, you know, they're when to lose weight fast in the summer. So summer is actually still a pretty good time. Um, you know, if you're working with people who are doing like enterprise sales, like, you know, finding out like when, and you're doing B2B, it's like, you know, Hey, this is the end of the quarters coming up and you know, you're trying to meet your projections. I can help you get to your projections. Like just really finding like the specific like stuff that's going on in their business cycle. And then, you know, crafting your pitch based on that. Cool. Let's do more. Sure. Let's go. Uh, okay. Fede says you also Italian. read. You gotta, you gotta like, you gotta translate. Like, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, you also read copy or marketing newsletter. Any advice? I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I want to build my own email list and I need some advice to start. Okay. I think we could help with that. I'm not sure what the first part's about, but anyway. Maybe he's just asking about, you know, copy and marketing newsletter. It's like any advice for them. Um, I'm not super good at that. Like I read Justin's a little bit. I should be better. Like, you know, I know people get like really great wins from Justin's newsletter. Um, I think it's valuable. I just am not like the best at reading like those newsletters, but I mean, you should, I mean, I think there's value to it, but I don't know about any advice beyond that. And then the second part you want to handle Ed? Yeah. Uh, building your own email list. Right. Yeah quality emails that people want to read that's it yeah and then tell i mean dude the thing too i don't do this as much anymore but like stuff about um like at the end like hey find this valuable make sure you know share friends forward like you know subscribe stuff like that like telling people what to do yeah be able to share tell people to tell their friends to subscribe have a link to the subscription stuff like that for sure sweet uh, okay. Mark asks, I'm writing copy for a client who's running a real estate company. What's the best marketing strategy to close clients to purchase villas and how should I approach it? I need a fresh mind. Nice. Okay. So you're getting clients to purchase villas. Ugh, I have more questions for this. I don't want to go into do live, but I don't think we have the time for it. So the best I can do for right now on it would be like, assuming that these are higher net worth people. Um, I look, I mean, a bunch of stuff that like, Porter like Stansbury did like that, like really like elite, like, like, like travel mastermind. And like, um, Agora had this stuff on these vacation destinations. But the point is I would be like trying to, from a copy perspective, like really just painting pictures of like luxury and life at these villas. Like imagine, you know, like waking up to like the roaring ocean and like, you know, like as you sort of stroll down a pathway into like your own private garden, um, you know, like, I don't know, things like that. Like, I think the most, the biggest thing there would just be really future pacing and like um, paint a picture and then probably coupling that with like some kind of hook around how it's way more affordable than you think, you know, because the biggest objection is always like everyone, no, it's very hard. You're not gonna talk to very many people who are like, oh, I don't want a villa. So everyone wants a villa. The objection is to be like, I can't afford it. But that's true regardless of if they actually do have like the net worth or the money to afford it or not. So I think it's like painting the picture and then kind of like promising that it's, it's much more, you know, within reach than you may think. Unless the, unless the clientele is just ultra high net worth people, in which case, they don't give a fuck. Then it's about like exclusivity and like that they are, they've earned it and deserve it and things like that. Mm -hmm. But if you come back next week, I can maybe if, if you have time, like next week, we can do that in more depth. But that, those are my depth. But those are my initial thoughts. Love it. Okay. 
Michael Ungoko asks, I have the opportunity to build out an affiliate marketing program in the finance investment space. I've never done it before. So how should I go about it? Honestly, join like Amber Spears' traffic tribe thing. If I don't think it's that, it's like $3.99 a month or something like that. I don't know if that's out of reach or not, but like you should join Amber's traffic tribe mastermind. Um, they have like weekly calls. It's like a whole group of people who are all sending traffic to each other's offers. Like she like basically was a consultant with Agora for like a long time. Um, like I'm not trying to like be like, I'm not, you know, people who are come on the show regularly know I don't usually just say throw money at this solution. But to me, that's a no-brainer. We're like joining, you can join, you know, Debron's marketing group too. But like, um, you know, I said three ninety nine, three ninety five a month. It's super awesome and worth more than three ninety five a month. Yeah, Laura's in it too, and Laura's doing traffic for her stuff. My wife, Laura. Um, I just think that's that's what you should do. Traffic tribe. Yeah. Traffic tribe. Uh, Chad Fallman asks, aside from an agency, which you hate, how can a copywriter replicate themselves? P.S. Please don't give me the mic. I'm in the shower. Um, amazing. <laughs> uh, so it's like maybe my first time answering for somebody while they're uh, in the shower, but replicating yourself. I mean, you know, I, you basically you could hire somebody to write. I mean, I don't know. Well, I think you have to do an agency model kind of to replicate yourself. Um, mm. You know, so but you don't have to create a huge agency, but you can hire, like, I, I go back to, I still struggle with this. Cause I'm like, damn, like I could, you know, hire people under me to basically follow RNBC. Like people see a light and, and see the like, topics are like now I'm like, I could just hire them, have them follow the steps. I just sort of look over it. And like, because they've been trained in my methodology and they're in the mastermind, all that, like and I've seen their copy, like they can write like 90% as good as I can. And then I could just go in and like tweak the rest of it, you know, and stuff like that. And um, I could keep charging the same fees and cut my work by like 90%. So I haven't done that really, but it's, it's tempting. Um, but the challenge is again, don't then just go like overload yourself with clients and don't like take on too many projects and, you know, make sure be prepared, make sure you hire the right person and all that kind of stuff. Um, oh, good. We caught Chad before he entered the shower. So now he's just sitting naked listening to my answer. Yeah. You're welcome, Chad. Um, unfortunately, hashtag onlyfans.com forward slash Chad Fallman, uh, you know, one, one, five, watch, watch that link actually be active though. <laughs> real weird, real fast. Okay. I got read the time. Right, one more, one more, excuse me, one more. All right. I don't have a call, so we can do one more. <sighs> Thanks man. Okay. You pick the last one, Stefan. Okay, boy, I gotta look. But then I feel bad for whoever I don't pick. Rich Mitchy, I saw yours. If you're still on the call, Rich, I'm gonna um, you email me as well. For you, Rich Mitchy, you always get a response, so I'll respond to your email. Um, Max, we already talked to. Uh, how do you increase focus and beat distractions? How do you effectively use Army's method to affect, to attract more customers for the for a staffing agency? Damn, there's a bunch of good questions here. Okay, so maybe I should choose for you then. You pick for me. I feel like I want to answer a bunch of them. I like steps. I like. Um, I gotta go. Okay, I like steps. Question. Got a question about closing on the phone. How do you go about getting commitment, and do you ask for the full price? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm on the phone I'm closing, I'm definitely asking for the full price. I mean, I think the biggest commitment is like a pre-qualifying them, making sure that they actually can afford whatever you're asking for, and so you know, do a little bit of research on them and kind of knowing where they're at. Um, the way I will do it is generally if I already know that they can afford my price, then I won't bring up money for like quite a while. I just provide value. Like I consult, right? I'm like an advisor. I consult. I give them, uh, you know, practical stuff they can do that like they can do without me. Um, and I just sort of give away the farm. And then I'm like, basically like, that's what you should do. I'm like, but if you know you, of course you can hire me. And I'm, inter and I'm interlacing stories of my doing this myself and having success for people and things like that. Um, and then, you know, I'm like, if you don't want to hire me, like, you know, here's what my, my fees, $50,000, um, you know, might be a lot to you, might be a little, maybe you expected, I have no idea, but you know, kind of explain why I charge that. And then I do the math, which I've talked about before doing the math for the client where it's like, you know, essentially, all right, say that they do whatever I create for them is going to, you know, create a, at least a million dollars. Right. And they're like, you know, they agree to that and their profit margin, like it's probably like 20% and they agree to that. And like, all right, cool. That's like, $200,000 profit from this and you're paying me 50,000. So that's a four X. But of course the goal is that, you know, you'll do like $10 million. 
um, which would give you like, you know, $2 million in profit at a 20% profit margin, which means you get like a 40X on paying me. So just doing the math um, is just significantly good. Now, if I'm not sure if the client is qualified or not, uh, I will chat, be nice, provide a little bit of value still, but I'll get to my pricing faster. And I'll be like, by the way, like, you know, yeah, like for me, it's like, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, like, you know, I, I like to say I'm expensive personally, but that's my brand, I guess too. But like, yeah, I'm like $50,000, um, you know, now the reason why is because of the results I get people and, you know, my incredible track record and I can explain more about that in a second. But I mean, I'm not sure first and foremost, you know, does that number like shocking or does it make sense? Is it what you expected? You know what I mean? Like, I just sort of um, let them answer that. Cause if they're like, oh my God, like, yeah, you know, oh, that's, that's crazy. You're like, all right, no problem. You know what I mean? Well, cool. What I can do is I can, um, I have some friends I can refer you to blah, blah, blah. But you know, at the same time, if they're like, you're like, yeah, no, well, I mean, that's a lot, but I mean, I can, I can see why it would make sense. Then you're like, oh, okay. And then you can keep going and do all the stuff where you add value and then go back to the, the price and uh, do the math. But yeah, I'm giving the price away for sure. Otherwise, like I hate, I hate, dude, like the whole thing of like, you don't tell them the price, you know, like I'll send you a proposal and you send the proposal and you're like, oh, I hope they don't think it's too much money. It's like, that's a, that's a, people do that because they're afraid of rejection because of their own worries of self-worth and their own value and their own insecurities about their skill level and the services they offer. So you should just be so confident what you're offering that like, you're like proud to say, say the price and you need to have a take it or leave it attitude, even though it's tough when you're like, you do need the client. I get it. But basically like the whole, um, like, you know, feeling of, of you, you can't, you can't be afraid. Like you can't be like, people know when people are thirsty or desperate or stuff like that. So you have to project like indifference essentially. So cool. That's my take on that. There we go. Sweet. It was fun. This is a fun one. I had a really good time, Ed. Me too. Awesome. So in that case, we're gonna wrap up. Thanks everybody for joining us on this episode of The Road to a Billion. We are gonna be off next Thursday because of Christmas. What? Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll do your, we'll, we'll talk. Maybe we can do the takeover show. Yeah, I do. Well, I, will, I do want to get Ed Ray takeover show in, this, in the near future. But bro, I'm Jewish. I ain't got Christmas. <laughs> I know you don't. Yeah, it could be like the the road to the road to a billion Hanukkah edition with Ed Ray. <laughs> oh man, today's the last day of Hanukkah though. I mean, you know, we can still have the. Uh, we'll figure it out. But <laughs> um, I'm not going to be doing it next week. We'll see if, if anything comes but of that. But thank you everyone for joining. Have a wonderful holidays. If I don't talk to you before then, um, if you're listening on iTunes, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you watch on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Please leave a comment. Let us know if you enjoyed this, the value you got, all that kind of stuff. It really means the world to us and helps with, you know, kind of reach and things like that. And, um, and smash the like button and all that kind of stuff too. And everyone just have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.